Hello, this is Gary. Hi, Gary. This is uh, David Liebert. How are you? Good. How are you doing, David? I'm doing fine. Uh, looking forward to our uh, conversation. Yeah, I'm excited about this. I know you got a bunch of stories to to share. I, I, maybe you won't have to share everything, you know, because you got a new book out and everything. <laughs> Let people read the book, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, there's a bunch of things uh, to talk about. Um, but like I said, the uh, new book called Rock and Roll Warrior. And, you know, I was thinking about a warrior is somebody that fights in a battle. Would you say that you you had been fighting a battle? I mean, I know it gets kind of rough out there. You know, it sounds like you're a survivor through all that, right? Well, I've, I've got the, uh, the the scars to prove it. Right. And, and, and what would you um, what would you say that was some of your hardest times back then? Well, you know, warrior doesn't necessarily mean difficult time. It just means it's a fight. Sure. You know, when a uh, when a general uh, is out on the field uh, in the middle of a war, it's um, you know, yeah, he may get he may get uh, killed. It's kind of risky, but there's also glory as well. Sure. Well, that's sort of it was sort of a dichotomy of two things. It's funny because. Uh, I didn't have a title for the book, so I just called it Rock and Roll Warrior for lack of a better title. And after a while, I said, you know what? It, <laughs> uh, it's not a bad title for this book. It works, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, well, there's, of course, a history of everything. Uh, I'm sure in the book it covers everything. Well, take me back to your childhood. How, how did you start out uh, in your life in uh, New Jersey how, that got you to this point? Um, my father, who was a lawyer by trade, also played the violin, and uh, he could play any song by ear, and my parents uh, uh, recognized early in my life that I had the ability, that same uh, uh, ability to uh, play uh, things on the piano uh, by ear first just the melody notes when I was five or six, but by the time I was seven or eight, I could play the accompanying chords as well. So my parents encouraged me, but didn't demand that uh, maybe I should take piano lessons and pursue, uh, you know, my uh, musical aspirations. And I really didn't have any, except I, I like music. I, I, I like the routine of, uh, uh, getting together with my uh, father routinely he on the uh, violin and me on the piano. And we used to, uh, you know, we used to fool around uh, uh, that way and play different songs. And uh, so I said, okay, yeah, yeah, maybe I should take piano lessons. But my parents said, okay, but it comes with uh, the stipulation that uh, if you agree to take piano lessons, you can't quit until we say so. Right. So I agreed. And uh, I ended up with uh, eight years of uh, classical training under my belt before I was old enough to say, I've had enough. All my friends are out there playing basketball and stickball and having a good old time, and I'm tethered to this keyboard. Uh -uh, not anymore. But, of course, the damage had been done. I had all of this training under my belt, and... Uh, um, I think years in my uh, later teens, I used to like to hang out in the parking lot of this restaurant where my friends and I used to congregate and and uh, uh, chirp is what we called it. And we would uh, harmonize in the uh, parking lot there singing you know, some of the popular doo-wop tunes of the day. We liked doo-wop music because right. they were the most fun to sing backgrounds the harmonies to and right. we started to realize we were as good if not better than most of the groups that we heard on the radio maybe we should t take a more serious look at all of this so at some point i started to hit the streets of tin pan alley uh, which is a section in new york city in manhattan uh, where there are several uh, buildings that house various uh, music companies, publishing companies, record companies, production companies. Um, and I would walk into uh, 
some of these offices. If it was a publisher, I was a songwriter. If it was a record company, I was in a band. If it was a production company, I was in a singing group. Mm-hmm. And so one day I uh, stumbled into the offices of Bright Tunes Production, which was a company owned um, and operated by The Tokens. Cool. The Tokens was another singing group at that time, and they had a couple of huge hits like The Lion Sleeps Tonight. Right. <laughs> And uh, tonight I fell in love, and we had this little uh, demo that they seemed to be impressed with, and they offered me and Bobby Miranda, who was the lead singer of our of our uh, group, a, a job in their offices. They'd give us a little room with a piano in it. We would write songs. Cool. Of course, they would own all the publishing, but uh, right. it was a start. Right. And um, part of the agreement was that they were going to produce the happenings. And that's kind of how it all got started. So cool. Well, how did you come up with the name, The Happenings? Well, we were called the four graduates, actually, and the tokens felt that was rather uh, passe for a name. So uh, uh, we were throwing around uh, a couple of names. Let's see, the... uh, uh, one of the names was the Corduroys, and there was another name. Uh, uh, I can't remember some of the other names, but uh, we settled on the happenings, and I'm grateful because um, I would hate to uh, have been uh, referred to as a Corduroy for all eternity. <laughs> yeah, so right. I was happy with the, with the with the name, the happenings. Right, right. Well, so how fun was that? So, you know, when you're with those guys and, you know, and you're hearing your songs, you know, on the radio and you're having these hits, how how cool was it to realize that you've actually made it? It was pretty cool. It, uh, we had uh, realized our dream that uh, that's what we wanted to have happen to um, it wasn't an easy thing. I mean, the, we worked with the tokens. We we had a couple of recording sessions. The the record company that distributed uh, uh, the record just insisted that we release "See You in September." We didn't really want to. There was another song we wanted to release, but the guy just basically just simply beat us into submission. In retrospect, I'm glad that he did and. It all went on from there when we had several hits uh, as the happenings. I got rhythm, go away, little girl, my mammy. Right. So we were we were riding pretty high there for for a while. Yeah, and uh, so like you said, it has to be exciting times and things like that. But you you write songs, so was that you know in your head? Were you thinking you're going to write for other people, or was that just kind of happened as time went by? Well, we actually did write for other people. Um, the Tokens produced the happenings, but they also produced other people as well. They produced, uh, for instance, they produced the Chiffons, who at that time had a couple of huge records. Uh, uh, um, He's So Fine, right. One Fine Day. Right. And then they had a hit single called uh, Sweet Talking Guy. And because the happening, uh, because the Tokens were the producers of the Chiffons, one of the songs that we had written was put on the album, Down, Down, Down. So that was pretty cool. We, really cool. we were writing for other people. And Bobby Miranda, my writing partner and the lead singer of The Happenings, uh, one of the few songs he had written on his own, uh, caught the ear of the producer of Jerry and the Pacemakers, this English band. Yeah. And the producer decided that this was going to be Jerry and the Pacemakers new single it's called girl on a swing now this was monumental because it just happens to that the producer of jerry and the pacemakers his name was george martin who also was the producer of the beatles Beatles. wow so cool so this was you know here we were were having hit records and uh, we're writing songs for other people so yeah we uh we were a good uh, songwriting team, actually. That's that's awesome. I, and uh, exciting times. I, I think that back then, you know, I mean, you probably had a, 
a better chance, I guess, than you would say to, well, I don't know, I guess with all the social media, you could put your music out there, but I guess, what do you think the odds of you making it back then compared to today, you know? I think the odds back then were much better. They were only 10,000 to one. Yeah. And today it's got to be 10 million to one. Look, yeah. um, it's easier to get your music out there today uh, through all of the delivery systems on social media and things like that. But it also means that everything is so diluted yeah. that there is no particular medium if you're lucky enough to, for instance, <clears throat> to get on the radio back then, uh, your audience was millions, just like that, boom, all of a sudden. Well, today radio doesn't mean all that much. Right. Uh, it was everything back then. Uh, today, it's, um, like I say, it's just another uh, delivery system of music, where back then it was pretty much the only delivery system of music so i think it's a lot tougher as tough as it was back then uh i think it's a lot tougher today so we were fortunate enough to have our uh you know pieces of the puzzle fall into place for us during a time where the odds were better even though they weren't really very good right. listen back then there were two hundred and fifty thousand bands all all vying for fame and fortune those aren't very good odds, really. No. Today, there's got to be millions. Got to be. And I guess, and that's another thing, you know that you made it back then when you have guys in record companies, you know, you're going in and you're showing your stuff. Today, you can produce your own stuff and put it on, like, Spotify. And, you know, it's like an instant, you know, song. But that doesn't mean you have fans and followers. It just means you put your stuff out there. But they actually exactly. desired exactly. you back then, yeah. And you had something back then, yeah. It showed, too. But, uh, yeah. Um, so how did you go from uh, The Happenings? So what happened after The Happenings? Well, um, we stopped having continuous hits, and I wanted to, uh, you know... The industry, the music world was changing. AM was, radio was everything at the time. And then, boom, all of a sudden, there's this FM radio, uh, basically up until then, a mostly unlistened to frequency band. <clears throat> and it seemed to become a conduit for these uh, AM unfriendly bands that were uh, playing their own instruments and writing their own songs. And I felt we had evolved into a band. We played our own instruments. But I wanted to apply what we did best, which was our harmony techniques, and apply it to more contemporary themes and structures, sort of like what Crosby, Stills, and Nash were doing at the time. Right. <laughs> and that didn't sit well with the rest of the happenings. Yeah, we did, we did uh, make a new album, but they didn't want to really add those songs to the show and they wanted to do what we uh, continue to do what we were doing, which was basically playing nightclubs and colleges. And we had comedy routines in our show and uh, imitate other uh, people. And yeah. I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to be more focused on the music and we just had a huge disagreement about it. And it all came to a head uh, one night and uh, I decided I was going to leave the band and pursue other avenues in the music industry. I had been for uh, maybe three years actually managing the happenings. We had gotten uh, rid of our original manager and I had taken over most of the management duties. So I had learned a few things in dealing with the record company and the uh, concert promoters and publicists and uh, agencies um, all those other things that needed to be attended to. Um, and I said, you know, I, I should, this is what I should be doing, uh, managing other bands or maybe becoming an agent. I was pretty sure I couldn't be a happening forever. Right. And, and so I guess that desire built up in you as far as managing. I know you went on to uh, be a tour manager for Alice Cooper, uh, which is pretty cool. What did what did you th what did you think of Alice Cooper the first time you ever met him? Well, I um, 
I got a call one day from Johnny Fudell, Alice Cooper's booking agent, said, you know, the Alice Cooper band's looking for a tour manager. I had done a few things prior to that. I was booking a club. After I left the happenings, I was booking a club in Long Island. I worked for uh, a management company in New York uh, for a short while. I had been a, a booking agent uh, for uh, Willard Alexander, booking big bands like uh, the Duke Ellington band, the Count Basie band. Absolute torture. But wow. in my quest to gain as much knowledge and experience as I could, uh, which I felt would lead to something, it was good to have all this new stuff under my belt. So when I got a call from uh, Johnny Fidel, go meet Shep Gordon, Alice Cooper's manager. They're looking for a tour manager. I got the job. And <clears throat> I remember that first night in Atlanta, I had thought I made the biggest mistake in my life. My first impression of all of this was 30 or 40 wild, crazy looking people <laughs> um, crawling all over all the gear and equipment like giant insects and I said oh my god what did I get myself into I really thought I had made the biggest mistake in my life Chef says look just pay attention observe what's going on you'll get the hang of it and he was right by the end of the week I, I started to figure things out and put it together and naturally it, uh, it became like the greatest job in the world and uh, I did that for about four years it was a great experience and maybe the most fun a, uh, a human being is legally allowed to have. Yeah, I'm sure. It was, it was, uh, it was great. We went all over the world and we had our own airplane on for tours and, and uh, the band was great. And Alice is a great guy. And uh, it was just a pleasure. It turned out to be great. Awesome. It was not the biggest mistake of my life after all. Right. Oh, I'm I'm glad it all worked out. Yeah, that I'm sure you you yeah. have some cool stories. Uh, so what? Uh, and, and and being a tour manager, I know you have to make decisions and do things like that, and and maybe give advice. Was there any advice that you ever gave Alice that stuck with him? No, it wasn't my job to give Alice Cooper advice. Okay. My job was to tend to uh, all of the nuts and bolts and details of the road logistically planning the tours and uh, leasing the airplane for the tour and uh, uh, going to the gigs and making sure the security was, uh, you know, a thousand details. I mean, it was sure. a very complicated good job, but no, I, I never said to Alice, yes, you know, sing it this way instead of that. That certainly wasn't my job. Okay. Uh, that was, uh, uh, it was my job to make sure it all ran smoothly on the road and that uh, everybody was as comfortable as they could be and make it a lot of fun for everybody. And uh, I did. I think I, I, uh, I think I prevailed in, in, in that pursuit. We all had a very good time. It was a lot of laughs and it was, uh, it was a lot of ball busting. You had to be a pretty good sport to... Uh, uh, to work for the Alice Cooper organization, uh, and everybody was. Everybody was a good sport, and everybody took a bit of friendly uh, abuse, and you know, right. albeit in, in good naturedly, which is what made it so much fun. We were just one big family, and uh, just out there having a good time. But everybody sure. knew that it was serious business, and you know, with all of the shenanigans and everything. Uh, the bottom line was it had to function like a well-oiled machine. That was basically my job. Awesome. And so how did you end up uh, leaving Alice Cooper and, and all in that set up there? Well, you know, it was, it was simply an almost overwhelming undertaking. Uh, it, um, you know, at the end of every tour, I wanted to quit. I was just... Uh, exhausted and, and Shep Gordon uh, would Alice's manager would bribe me back with um, more and more uh, salary increases and bonuses so uh, finally after uh, f four years of this uh, there wasn't enough money he could bribe me uh, to, to remain I was simply burned out and also I wanted to 
um, you know, set out on other um, endeavors within the music uh, business uh, with all this experience and um, that I had under my belt. I wanted to apply this knowledge to, um, you know, other aspects of the music industry and, and earn my living that way. Right. And, uh, of course, you uh, went on to manage uh, George Clinton. And uh, how, how different mm-hmm. was that for, for George Clinton, you know, when you go, go from Alice Cooper to George Clinton? It was like night and day on a certain level. But on another uh, level, it was the same. You know, all bands that achieve uh, uh, the success that Alice Cooper or Parliament Funkadelic has uh, enjoyed. Um, there are certain things that are the same. The logistics are the same. The travel is the same. The uh, um, and I was able to apply all of the um, things uh, and all of the st- you know the state. Alice Cooper had a lot of staging and props, and uh, it was a very complicated affair. Well. So did George Clinton. He had a spaceship laying on stage every <laughs> night. So and, cool. uh, he had all kinds. So what I was able to do for George uh, almost immediately was make his rather chaotic, uh, uh, you know, entourage apply a lot of the Alice Cooper stuff uh, and made it a really well-oiled, very smooth-running operation. Uh, he thought I was a genius, but actually... I had learned all that from, you know, uh, working with Alice Cooper and Chef Gordon was a very demanding guy. He demanded absolute perfection. I was able to apply that to a lot of the George uh, Clinton uh, uh, um, touring and management, and uh, it worked out well. Yeah, it really I, worked out well. That's what I was going to say, and I know as you went through each stage, you know, in managing and things like that, you learned a lot and you took a lot of stuff with you. So, um, I know that, uh, each time you would go to a new position or a new job, you'd have to learn something else, you know, but as time went by, were, were there some regrets that you had that you could go back and change? What would it be? Well, certainly, I mean, I, uh, I don't regret my life, but of course I regret some of the mistakes that I made. Uh, I, um, I was a breath away from managing guns and roses. That would have been nice. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that story. The guns and roses. Uh, how, how did you get, uh, how did you get so close to guns and roses? And, and not- well, I got a call from the notorious Kim Fowley one day. And although, uh, because uh, I had been the uh, booking agent for the Runaways when I had my booking agency, and uh, and then later on became the manager of Cherie Curry's film career. Cherie was the lead singer of the Runaways, of course, right. and uh, Kim Fowley was the manager producer of the Runaways. Uh, he called me one night. He says, uh, "Liebert, go over to this." Uh, a storage unit. There's uh, there's a band that lives there. They're called Guns N' Roses. Uh, check them out. So I go over there. I check them out, and I was just blown away. Uh, it was obvious to me that these guys are really something special. Uh, they were the real deal, and by that I mean not because they wrote great songs, which they did. And they were extraordinary musicians, which they were. By saying that they're the real deal what i mean is they were always guns and roses they were never not guns and roses either individually or collectively Mm -hmm. um and that was a very it had a very intoxicating effect on i think everyone you know when i did my little run of dates with the finished my little run of dates with the happenings i went home i was david liebert i was no longer a runaway these right. guys were never not Guns N' Roses, right. and uh, that affected everybody. I don't know if it was their uh, their state of mind or their uh, such confidence in themselves, but uh, you simply knew that they were going to be huge. Right. And uh, 
I wasn't able to, that's what I got close to them. I started hanging out with them and wanted to manage them, but I needed to get them off the, uh, off the street. Rehearsing in a storage locker room, it was fine. Living there wasn't, there were no, uh, there was no running water, or bathroom facilities, and um, but I simply wasn't able to get it together. You know, I was kind of messed up myself at that point in life. Um, wasn't able to get it together to really uh, uh, lend the kind of uh, support that they needed. Would I know how to manage them? Yeah, but I simply was in no position to... Uh, do it. I, I actually went to my brother, who was a, a very well-to-do doctor. He lived in Florida, and I made a deal. I offered him a deal. Uh, let me twenty thousand dollars a repayable loan, and I'll give you twenty percent of the management of Guns N' Roses. That twenty grand uh, would have gotten them off the street, and I would have put them in a you know a big house where they could uh, live and rehearse. And uh, I knew exactly how to get him a record deal. And uh, I wasn't able to get hold of my brother after that. After several days, I finally was. And he said, you know, I spoke to my accountant. He, he said $20,000 is very risky to invest in a, an unknown band. Uh, and he said his 16-year-old son listened to the demo, which, by the way, was pretty much note for note the same as Appetite for Destruction album. Mm -hmm. And he said, these guys aren't that good. They really need a lot of work. So my brother passed on the deal. Oh, wow. And that was the end of that. And then later you see that they made it big and you're like, oh, man. You're right? Yeah. I mean, sure. Uh, listen, everybody has a story about the one that got away. That's mine. And uh, I remained friends with them. And uh, they gave me a multi-platinum uh uh, album for Appetite for Destruction. And, uh, you know, I remain friends with them and still do, uh, especially Slash. They're good guys. I like them. Awesome. That's awesome. And uh, so uh, you were talking about the Runaways. I think uh, you managed uh, what, Bootsy Collins and uh, uh, what, Sheila E. back in the 80s, and you, you, you hung out with Prince. Can you talk about the Prince uh, story? I like Prince. Yeah, you know, he was. Uh, he was an unusual guy, obviously. Uh, very socially awkward. Uh, I mean, Alice Cooper was a very engaging, charming uh, guy. You know, he would he would be as comfortable hanging out with one of his roadies as he would hanging out with Mick Jagger. He was just a real down to earth guy. Right. Uh, then he would go on shows uh, like Hollywood Squares and play golf with Perry Como. Right. Prince avoided those kinds of situations like the plague. Yeah, and he could be pretty brutal with everybody. And I don't know if it was because of his, he was kind of di uh, diminutive in stature. He's only about five foot two. Yeah. But whereas Alice Cooper ruled out of love, everybody loved the guy. They never wanted to let him down. Prince ruled out of fear. Everybody would walk on uh, uh, eggshells around him. On the other hand, he was very nice to me, and I think it was because, first of all, I was older than most of the people in his small inner circle. He knew of my association, my past association with George Clinton, someone who he absolutely idolized, and my association with Alice. I guess he just didn't want to look like an obnoxious jerk in front of me. So right. it's, I'm amazed that Prince even cared what I thought about him, but I, apparently he did. So I have no complaints about Prince. And, and he's certainly one of the most incredibly talented people I've ever, ever been associated with. It, it was a privilege. Sure. I'm sure it was. Um, well, all the stories that you combine together for your, uh, new book, uh, it's called Rock and Roll Warrior. Um, are, are they going to make a movie about this book? They're, they're actually kicking the idea around a couple of studios, and that would be that would be great. Um, I uh, that would be the the icing on the cake with the cherry on top. Uh, I would I would love that. Uh, 
So who would you get to play you in the movie? Um, oh, I don't know. And I'm not even sure that the movie would be about me. It might just be about someone like me. Like you. Okay. I think that's one of the things that they're kicking around. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, some people would suggest Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> I would suggest uh, Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt. Yeah, of course you would. <laughs> of course I would. <laughs> that's never going to happen. <laughs> hey, you never know. It might, it might you happen. never know. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just being sarcastic. So, uh, so fifty plus years in the music industry. So, what are you doing these days besides writing a book? I'm mostly living a nice, leisurely life in the in the high desert out here by uh, uh, Joshua Tree, oh. about 120 miles east of. Uh, and my main activity these days is not so much in the music business. I'm pretty much semi-retired. Um, I'm an animal rights activist now. As a matter of fact, while I'm speaking with you, I am ensconced in canine. I, <laughs> I have uh, my three dogs just flopped all over me. They all think they're lap dogs, even though one of them is 90 pounds. Wow. And uh, I've... Uh, I've become an advocate for animal rights and, uh, you know, s say what you will about social media like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, their ilk. Uh, it's uh, been a, a huge um, plus for um, animal rights, uh, making people aware of the plight of ab abused, abandoned, and... Uh, uh, you know, dogs that need to be fostered and adopted. It's it's uh, decreased in the last few years the euthanasia rate of uh, dogs and cats by ninety something percent. That's how influential social media has been. So uh, I've learned to uh, work with rescue organizations and try to find homes for deserving uh, dogs and uh, actually adopting a few of my own and. Uh, that's been taking up a good deal of my life, but um, I do very few things within the music. But, hey, people call me all the time. Would I like to manage them, produce them? Uh, can I pick your brain? All of that stuff. I turn down almost everything. Oh, wow. And once in a while, I may become intrigued by something that sounds like it, uh, it might be fun. Uh, uh, or I can make a little money in the process, or it could be interesting, but hardly at all. I'm happily retired, living in the desert, uh, running around with my dogs and trying to help others. Well, that, there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and you know, you deserve to, to rest and hang out with dogs <laughs> in the okay. desert. And, uh, but... I'll, take that, I'll, take that as a, <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment, Gary. <laughs> but it's just... It's true. Uh, uh, you know, dogs. Uh, listen, uh, one thing I noticed, uh, you know, when, when you know, when you come out late, come home late, your your wife or girlfriend isn't very pleased about that. Right. Well, let me tell you something with dogs. The later you you come home, the happier they are to see you. <laughs> that's, that's true. I, I, uh, I had to take care okay. of a friend of mine's dogs and and. Uh, and he, they love me too. And they'd come jump on me and they're huge like horses and they'll jump on me and <laughs> knock me down. But man, full of love. There's nothing like a, a dog. You know? I know. I know. It's great. Man's best friend. Well, I, I appreciate you talking to me and I, and I'm uh, excited for you. I know you're going to still be talking about this book, uh, rock and roll warrior for a while. And uh, hopefully everybody will pick up a copy and uh, they can get it at uh, Amazon or, you can get an autographed copy simply by going to rockandrollwarrior.com. Awesome. Well, there you go, everybody. Uh, David Liebert, thank you so much for joining me today, and uh, all the best to you. Enjoy the dogs, and the, and have a great day, and uh, and have I mean, just have fun. Hey, like I said, you've earned this. <laughs> you've earned it. I don't know if I earned it, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll go Thank you very much, Gary. This is this has been fun. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll I'll see you. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, bye. Bye bye.